Welcome to the introduction to synchrotron-based X-ray spectroscopic imaging. The purpose of this presentation is to provide a broad overview to the topic of uh, X-ray microprobe imaging, and in particular, how we combine X-ray spectroscopy into imaging to uh, enhance our images and chemical information in those images. Uh, first, I'm going to start with a little overview. Uh, you may be familiar with some of these concepts, but uh, just to get everyone on the same point of view. Uh, most of the times when we are doing these types of imaging experiments, we are using a synchrotron. Uh, I'm from SSRL, so I have it as well, SSRL front and center there. Uh, but there are many wonderful facilities throughout the world that can do these types of experiments as well. And a few of them are shown here. Well, why is a synchrotron so cool, though? Uh, synchrotron radiation is, you know, nearly six orders of magnitude brighter than your conventional tube sources. Uh, and this is important because not only are they much brighter, giving you more flux and the ability to focus down to smaller spot sizes due to the brightness, the synchrotron radiation is also polychromatic and tunable. Um, what that really means is that you're providing the entire X-ray spectrum at this high brightness and intensity, unlike a conventional source, which might provide a high brightness around the uh, spectral line of the tu tube metal of interest and then have a broad continuum uh, that is much weaker. So the ability to have this high brightness and high flux means that you can use a monochromator and select a particular wavelength out of the entire spectrum. This allows us to tune in to the resonance or the fluorescence of a particular element of interest, say one of the transition metals. And this shows the absorption edges of several transition metals, and you can see how they all have their own absorption edge, and so we can tune in to look at a particular metal, or tune the energy at least to be above or below to remove or enhance uh, contrast uh, for the particular sample that we are looking at. When we talk about X-ray fluorescence, uh, this is part of the photoelectric effect. Uh, here is our atom, a stylized uh, image of one with the nucleus and a cloud of electrons around the outside. You can have an X-ray photon come in, and it will excite from the ground state uh, an electron and emit that out there. That is the absorption event. Uh, given that you have the energy in the X-ray that can excite that state, it will be uh, emitted. And now you have an excited ionized atom. It's going to want to return to the ground state, and so that will return here. And in, in that process, it will emit an X-ray photon. Uh, you can also have um, emission of electrons and such as well. But for the most part, when we're talking about X-ray fluorescence, we will talk about the X-ray emission. The great thing about this is that every element has its own unique set of X-ray absorption edges and emission lines. And we can use this to identify the element that has been excited. So here is a uh, model X-ray fluorescence spectrum. And here we are identifying the elements that are present. Uh, you can see that we have uh, calcium, iron, and zinc on the K-alpha line, lead on the L lines, and there's also some other things like copper uh, also present in that one as well. Uh, here the x-axis is energy and the y-axis is intensity. And we can either integrate the, these peaks fully as the red line is trying to do on this graph, or just bin all the data in between the, say, the bottom edge of the peak and the top edge of the peak to integrate that area. Uh, ideally trying to remove some backgrounds in the long term. And this will give us the semi-quantitative, in terms of counts, the amount of element that's present at a particular spectrum. Now the converse to apply to this too, or the additional information, is X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, the XS here is basically this modulation of the absorption coefficient as we go through energies that are near the absorption edge. Uh, it can be broken into several different sections, the near edge, the fine structure in the post edge area, and 
all of these are essentially producing some information on the element's local coordination and or the chemical state. Um, we can also use the pre-edge region, so this is the region where we're not exciting fully into the uh, the uh, electrons not being fully promoted outside of the uh, atom to probe the unoccupied states of the uh, electronic states of the atom as well. All these characteristics give us information like coordination, chemical oxidation state, and it has the benefit that it can really apply to just about any element on this periodic table that we can excite with our x-rays. Uh, this works great at low concentrations and it really has minimum sample requirements, which is why it is very applicable to doing uh, X-ray microprobe measurements. Um, of course, there are important things we have to be care careful of to avoid artifacts and such. Um, but overall, it is very uh, forgiving in your experiment. Now, in the way that we typically will use this in microprobe imaging and combining image and spectroscopy, we are usually combining the near edge spectrum or the zanes with that. And we often will use this in a fingerprinting type of way. And using this to identify the chemistry or the species of the element of interest. Here I'm showing uh, six iron spectra. And you can see that, that there are many differences. So between, say, the oxides of hematite and ferrihydrite, and pyrite and siderite, uh, sulfides, carbonates and clays and the biotite, there are dramatic differences and you can just by looking at them, uh, tell them apart very easily between the oxidation state and the structure. On the other hand, trying to tell the oxides apart, hematite and ferrihydrite, could be very difficult in this manner. So there are some pluses because it's easy to do and minuses because you don't always have the full contrast. Uh, now there are many different uh, energies that a beamline can have and a microprobe might uh, have. You have hard x-ray sources, uh, typically greater than 4 keV. And you can access basically elements, uh, titanium and higher in the periodic table. Um, and so these are the access of edges to excite for spectroscopy. Um, you are still going to be able to excite some of the lower z elements and maybe be able to see their fluorescence, but you won't be able to do the spectroscopy on those. Um, on the opposite end of the X-ray spectrum are the soft X-ray sources, so 200 to 2,000 eV, more or less. And that gives you access to the uh, very light, low Z elements, uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Now, these elements don't have a lot of fluorescence, so this is normally done in transmission, which brings in a whole other, other uh, set of potential sample preparation issues and, and gotchas to watch out. In between is this uh, strange land between 2 and 5 keV, roughly. Um, it's commonly called tender x-rays, but I really despise that term, so I like to call them the squishy x-rays, as the in-between, between hard and soft. Um, there's lots of great chemistry that occurs in this range, uh, particularly the biological elements of phosphorus and sulfur. And we'll talk a lot more about uh, sulfur and imaging uh, later on in this presentation. There are lots of sources of X-ray data. Um, if you don't have the periodic table and the X-ray energies memorized yet, uh, there is the infamous uh, orange book, which has a great reference for all of these data. And the Center for X-ray Optics also has a uh, nice online uh, resource for looking at not only X-ray edges and emission lines, but also a lot of the properties of the elements. Uh, xfs.org also has this particular table that Matt Newville has put together. And not only does it have the, the periodic table, it also gives you detailed information for each element. This is manganese, my, one of my favorites, including common oxidation states, absorption lines, and emission lines. And it also provides uh, a really nice diagram that shows what we're talking about when we say K, L, M edges, so what orbitals are being excited excited out of, and with the nomenclature of K alpha, K beta, et cetera, uh, where the uh, electron that is re returning to the ground state is coming from. And that gives you a lot of information then of what orbitals are being probed by this particular process. Um, so this is another great resource for remembering all the names of all the uh, electronic transitions that we are discussing. 
Okay, so now on to the X-ray microscope. What is does the X-ray microscope actually do? Well, this is kind of an old-fashioned microscope. Obviously, we've come a long way. Uh, the X-ray microscope, though, effectively is going to examine elemental composition and the chemistry on a microscopic scale. And we're, and we're going to combine both of these techniques that we've discussed so far of fluorescence and spectroscopy to effectively get a chemical image of the sample. And the great thing about this technique in particular is that many scientific interests in specimens from environmental samples, biomedical, geological, uh, energy systems, all have interesting chemistry that can occur on this microscopic scale of submicron-ish to micron range. Um, so the X-ray microprobe is a really great uh, instrument to try to probe and examine these chemistries on this scale. Uh, so this is a little cartoon diagram of the microprobe in action. Uh, unlike uh, uh, electron microscopes, uh, the X-ray microscope, you can't uh, actually bend the uh, probing beam. Photons don't have charge, so they cannot be bent easily. So instead of having the uh, bunch of magnets that could turn the uh, electron beam around to probe the sample, you have to raster the sample around the static X-ray beam. And this here is showing the yellow incident X-ray beam. Uh, it's the sample is now rastering uh, back and forth across that beam. And we see the fluorescence being emitted at different pixels with different colors denoting different X-ray energy. Um, I always tend to age myself when I show this slide, and I liken this to the old-fashioned dot matrix printers where you raster back and forth and form one line of the image at a time. So what's so great about the X-ray microprobes? Well, you really have the advantage of being able to use the microscale beam to probe and separate complex mixtures um, by segregating things spatially. This is showing a um, set of sand grains that have been coated in manganese oxide. And if you were to look at the bulk, you might see that just, there's just a little bit of manganese and a little bit of zinc on this manganese, but most of the volume is are not those elements, so you'd have a very small signal. If we can go zoom into this very closely, not only do we see here we have the silicon in red, the manganese in green, zinc in blue, not only do you see these uh, interesting relationships, but you see there's actually mixtures of manganese and zinc in some areas and on a more pure zinc in others. And if you were to say, um, do X-ray diffraction on this as a whole bulk sample, um, you would see all kinds of diffraction spots coming out of the place. You'd see the sand diffracting in these big spots, maybe some of the uh, coatings diffracting in rings, and you'd have a big mess of uh, data to interpret. Now, if we bring ourselves to a very small microscale beam, though, not only can we get a particular phase, so this is now looking at that surface precipitate, and you can really see what that one phase of zinc is lost amongst the rest of the zinc that's absorbed on the manganese oxide. But ideally now you can also get a very clean uh, diffraction pattern too if you were doing diffraction. And just looking at those ideally single phases, so being able to isolate out those single phases uh, or close to single phases is one of the advantages of the microprobe. Uh, we also are improving signal to noise on small particles, kind of as we were hinting at in the last slide. If I have a very large beam, most of my beam is not hitting my particles of interest, and my signal might be very low, particularly in a transmission type experiment. So I can bring that beam down to a very small spot. Most of what is the probe is interrogating is actually my sample, and my signal to noise is much improved. Uh, finally, um, you know, everyone doesn't have a synchrotron in their backyard, um, and electron microscopy is a much more common um, standard piece of equipment. And uh, I don't you know, disparage them whatsoever, and they're actually a very great complementary source of information. Uh, you have great special spatial resolution in a TEM or SEM, and you can use, you can still excite X-ray emission lines with the electron. Um, one of the down parts though, of course, is that you do typically need a high vacuum sample environment, or at least partial vacuum. Um, and not all samples are compatible to being put into a vacuum chamber. Um, since you are hitting it with electrons, you often need to be able to bring that excess charge away. 
and that requires coding your samples or having very thin slices. And this also might not be amenable to all particular samples. Um, the other part of uh, electrons is that the penetration depth is very small. Uh, so you're only looking at the surface typically in an SEM. Um, in contrast, the X-ray microprobe is somewhat resolution limited. Um, with the best mirrors that are around today, you're in the submicron range typically. Um, you can do a little, bit, a little bit better with zone plates, but then we sacrifice <clears throat> some of the energy resolution um, information. Um, but the advantages here are that we can collect data in ambient conditions. Um, you can put different gases in there um, or just run them normally in air. Uh, you can also do reactions. Um, since you can mix things in the in, in atmosphere or in small chambers, you can actually perform small chemical reactions and watch them in situ. The sample prep is relatively easy. You don't need to slice and dice um, or coat them. And the X-ray penetration depth is much deeper, too, so we can actually see a lot more information deeper into the sample. This can be a plus and a minus, but uh, it often gives you um, greater information than just um, what is on the surface. And finally, the real, the real important part here that the X-ray microprobe can do over uh, traditional electron microscopy is getting that chemical information. Uh, the ability to do uh, X-ray spectroscopy is really um, a, a really big strength. So let's talk about a real example application. This here is a sand grain that is um, from the rifle uh, site in Colorado. And this, in this particular site, they were concerned about the flow of and transport of uranium in the aquifer from a tailing site that had been left. Um, this particular grain here, you see it's got this nice brown orangish coating, so it looks like a nice iron oxide on there. And the question would be, how does the uranium partition throughout this uh, aquifer? If we take a look at the image data, here's a, several of the elements of interest. And so you can see the sand grains come out quite nicely. Um, some of the other mineral grains showing calcium and silicon. And lo and behold, just where you begin to see those uh, orangish brownish uh, coating on there, you see a lot of iron on there as well. And this iron also matches somewhat along with the uranium distribution in the bottom left there. Um, and so since this is an oxic aquifer, you might go, oh, this is great. Let's take a look at how these two elements correlate. And so we can take the iron in the red and the uranium in the green and overlay those in a bicolor plot. And we see that there really is this nice correlation between the iron and the uranium. And again, because it is oxic, you might say, well, this is probably iron oxides. Uh, we know iron oxides are a sponge for all kinds of metal contaminants. Uranium is no different. And so we are just absorbing all that uranium onto the iron, and I know exactly what's happening in my system. Um, if you don't quite trust that initial interpretation, you can always look at a few X-ray absorption spectra. You can take a few spectra at different spots there. Um, in the iron uh, slide there, you see that we've picked several different spots uh, of the spectra there in the white dot. And it does look, in a fingerprint sense, very much like iron oxide. But there's a little bit of uh, some funny uh, stuff happening on the low energy side of that edge. So this might want us to delve into this question a little bit more. So how can we do that? Well, let's do micro XAS and imaging together. So what we've shown so far is on a larger uh, qualitative term, depending on the beam size, of course. On these larger areas, we've looked at the fluorescence composition in the map. Um, in this case, we uh, overlaid a few elements to look at the correlation. We can also do that analytically with a graph. And on some small discrete points, we've picked out, we've done some veins and or excess. Uh, now, the real power of what we want to do is try to combine these two techniques together. And uh, so why bother with this kind of process, right? Um, so this always, um, I always try to use this example. So there's this uh, adage that you may have heard, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I really wanted to know where this uh, phrase came from. I always thought this was some sort of really great ancient wisdom that had been handed down through the ages. Uh, it turns out, though, it was actually invented in the early 1920s uh, from a 
um, newspaper man, Fred Barnard, who was trying to sell um, advertising for his newspaper in Chicago. And he realized that if he could sell a image uh, print ad rather than a text print ad, he could charge about 10 times more money for the advertising. And so he coined this phrase to really just make more money for his newspaper. Um, but it does relate because when I'm doing spectroscopy, um, this is some of the data that I created during my postdoc, and I have all these squiggly lines, and I'm trying to convince you maybe that the, the line in A is drastically different from the squiggly line down further, and what that means structurally just by these you know, small variations in these squiggly lines, uh, which there are some great variations, mind you. But it might be much more convincing to be able to show how these things change spatially by showing you a diagram like this. And so in this case, uh, um, we will update the proverb to say a picture could, could actually be worth about 13,940 spectra instead. Uh, so what are we really doing with XAS imaging here? Um, so we're effectively taking several X-ray fluorescence maps at various excitation energies through this absor absorption edge. Now, there are many names that uh, have been used for this process, XAS imaging, chemical imaging. Um, one of my new favorites is selected excitation energy XAS, because that's exactly what we're doing, just selecting several excitation energies rather than the entire spectrum. And we'll examine the fluorescence field at these energies. Uh, and ideally, we have picked good energies, and we'll talk about that a little, a little bit later, uh, to provide the maximum amount of contrast, so chemical contrast is required here. Um, for example, on the left here, we see uh, normalized spectra for sulfur compounds. And the beautiful thing is that you have a lot of contrast in sulfur. Between the minus two oxidation state and the plus six oxidation state, there is nearly 15 EV of separation and all the different um, redox states in between show up quite nicely too. Um, this contrast basically allows us to uh, determine where these um, oxidation states, chemical species, and or molecular signatures are all distributed spatially. And what we're going to do is effectively a least square fitting on a shortened XAS spectrum. So instead of using all the points that we have, uh, we will only use a subset of those points, maybe five, six, 10, depending on the circumstance. Now we'll go back to our uh, iron sand grain here. On the left here, we have six iron images that are collected through the edge. Now they don't look that different, but they all do highlight slightly different chemistries as we are going through that absorption edge. Uh, and it's not only that we want to take the data process it when we get home and have a eureka moment, but we also want to have that eureka moment at the beam line. We can actually use this process to guide our data collection, and that will be one of the themes that I'm trying to bring across today. Um, so, you know, the normally the, the things that you might do would be, oh, I'm at the beam line, it's always, uh, by the time you finish an image stack like this and want to pick spectra, um, just by the knack of Murphy's Law, it's always at like two in the morning and you're exhausted. Maybe it's the last day of your beam time and you really need to have the best results. And your eyes always try to bias you. And so you always want to go and say, oh, I want to get the best signal. So I'm going to choose all these really intense points on the right-hand side of that particle. And that way, you know, um, I'll get the best signal to noise. I'll get the best representation of the iron in my sample. However, if we look at these other methods here, uh, we, can see that we can see that that is not the uh, best approach. Uh, so one nice thing is, ideally, we are selecting out all of the differences in the chemistry by going to the different absorption uh, ed locations in the absorption edge. Uh, so we can do a method called principal component analysis there on the bottom that now will do an abstract mathematical uh, separation of where the, the greatest differences are. And so we can plot those in a tricolor plot of red, green, and blue of, say, the three strongest components. And you can see where you get the most pure phase bit. And so if we collect along that really intense uh, edge uh, line there, we see that we're actually getting the most intricate mixture of two of the components, the green and the blue. And actually some of the best spots to measure are where it would be in an area where you see just the red, uh, just the blue, and that little tiny corner off on the, on the side there even, 
and try to isolate the green in its uh, you know, most green position. This is a great way to really deconvolve your sample and try to find where you have isolated components. There's another method that we'll uh, also talk about a little bit later, uh, simplex volume maximization. And this actually uses the spectra in your sample as standards effectively. It's going to look through and look at the variation of your sample and say the dimensional space that your sample and their energies uh, uh, capture and try to find all the points that, find, that define the edges of that dimensional space and then show them as an individual spectrum and then now you can reset your data as a linear combination of those spectra in a positive sense. And now you can begin to see that you know, in the simplex volume method on the top there so we see that it finds three spectra. Um, and now these are all shortened spectra, so they don't have all the rich detail as a full Zane spectrum. But you can see the shapes that we were kind of looking at. There are some edges that look like an oxide in the, in the yellow there. Maybe something that looks a little bit more unique in the red. Um, some, and there's some different combinations in something like the green there. And so there's some really interesting uh, chemistry that we know we can separate out. Uh, the last one is actually linear combination fitting. So once we've identified what's the most likely candidates, we can actually do a combination fitting of a known standard back onto our sample. In this case, we've uh, realized that we have the oxides and also some sulfides, which is an interesting uh, um, thing to learn in this particular sample. And we can combine those and fit those back. Now, the really great thing here is that when we do this and now overlay the uranium distribution, we see that um, while the uranium certainly is distributed with the iron, it is also distributed only with a particular iron phase. So it is really absorbed mostly only onto the iron, oxide, uh, iron sulfides rather than the iron oxides. And this is a great, interesting find because this now showed the dynamics of this oxic aquifer, how it goes through different redox conditions and how even a transient phase can be very important in the uh, uptake and sequestration of uh, elements like uranium. Well, so that's a great conclusion, but now let's do a reality check. Can we really get a good measurement of chemical information on say six energies? Um, so here we have our maps again. And what we did in this case, I think this is one of the most over-measured grains of sand um, that I've ever done. I went back to the grain and measured um, hundred, you know, almost 100 different uh, Zane's points. And I wanted to compare what the speciation determination of a linear combination fit with six points was compared to a full spectrum, say the 120 points to the uh, normal Zane spectrum. And how do those two methods compare? On the right here, you can see the difference between the full Zane and the CXAF are very, very close. Um, there's, of course, a little bit of difference in some areas, uh, just due to methodological and noise in the sample. Um, but we're typically less than 5% of the speciation away, and that's typically within what we would consider the normal error bar of a measurement of Zane. Um, so the method is, is quite robust in the end, too. Um, but why is it robust? Well, because we have done it with the best uh, contrast. Um, this is one of the requirements for your uh, XAS imaging here is to have these differentiable species and have that contrast between the species of interest. Um, in an ideal case, you might have something like arsenic or sulfur, as we showed earlier, where you have dramatically different uh, intensities of your fluorescence at the energies of interest. Uh, good would be, to say, the iron example that we just went through, where you can see that there's differences between the sulfides and the carbonates and the oxides. Now, if your experimental goal was to tell all the differences between the various iron oxide polymorphs, that's ferrihydrite, hematite, uretite, acrotocyte, um, these are all extremely similar. There's not much contrast until you get into the excess regions. And so this falls into the category of non-ideal slash near impossible to really do effectively. Um, we also need to have n plus one measurements. So if you have n species you want to look at, you need to have at least n plus one measurements or variables to actually uh, get a, a real determination. How do we pick those n plus one energies? Well, again, high contrast is what we're looking for. Um, so ideally, you might know a little bit of geochemical knowledge of 
the mixture of energy that you might want to use. Um, that was always helps. Um, and if that is a case, you can look at your uh, standard compound library, for instance, and look and see what those differences are. Another approach is if you don't really know what's in there, uh, we can use uh, a PCA method on the actual spectra. So we can go and take maybe a, a dozen or so spectra in areas after getting the first image and do PCA on that. So on that top right image, you see a whole bunch of spectra. You see the clays that are there kind of standing out differently from the mixture of sulfides and oxides. But by doing PCA on that, while the PCA spectra on the right there don't have a physical meaning necessarily, they're just the differences from the average essentially, what they are telling us is where we have differences from the average in that sense. And that is where we have the most contrast. And so if we pick the um, ideal minima and maxima at, throughout the region of interest to the same, those are the regions where we will have the best contrast. Now, um, we do need to have N plus one energies. Um, and this often, I would say, a controversial uh, statement on uh, which energies are the best. Um, a lot of colleagues of mine, and I used to do this as well, will often take an energy above the edge. And the argument for that is that, well, if I have an energy a measurement above the edge, I can get the total amount of iron or the element in my sample. Well, there's no contrast there. There's no contrast at that point, so there's no information technically other than the total amount of iron. And so that cannot be used in the N plus one sense because there is no contrast. And if we do a linear combination of fitting, regardless, we get the concentration out. That's one of the parameters, the total amount of mass. You can sum up all the elements, and that's your total amount of mass, the total number of species. So it really is a redundant measurement that is not required whatsoever. Uh, the other one that um, is often measured is one that's below the edge. Now, this is one that I tend not to measure very often, but there are good cases when you, can't, when you need to. If you have an interference from another element and you have um, some sort of overlapping fluorescence that comes into your uh, measurement window, you will need to remove that. So you would need to add that uh, measurement to properly uh, background subtract your data. That's one of the only good reasons to include um, a below the edge measurement. Because again, there is no contrast there. It's only being used for background removal and it cannot be added to your N plus one energy. You need N plus one energies within the edge that have contrast to actually make your measurement uh, work properly. I'm going to go to another example here. This is uh, uh, looking at sulfide mineralization. When I was first bringing up my sulfur beam line, I wanted to look at some real sulfur compounds and see how they could look like. And I was able to convince some of my uh, colleagues to look at the mineralogy that happens at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, the bottom of the ocean and these mid-ocean ridges has a very rich set of life that grows down there. And they're all feeding off of this chemical form of energy that's being uh, released in from these hydrothermal vents. This is from the Indian Ocean. And there is this lovely critter down here that is um, a snail. And it is actually one of the only known eukaryotes to actually biologically precipitate uh, both pyrite and grigite. Uh, iron sulfides on its uh, body. I won't try to attempt to murder the Latin name of this uh, uh, lovely uh, animal, uh, but the common name is the scaly foot gastropod, and it's very aptly named because it grows those precipitated scales on its foot. And so I'm going to use this as an example of what not to do and how to do things properly as well. Um, so. I was trying to look at these scales really quickly. I was setting up uh, different users and in the, in the transition period, I thought, oh, I can just do this really quickly, make a few measurements, get a spectra, and I'll have my answers, and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to move on to the next experiment. Um, and so here's my sulfur image uh, from blue to red, lows to highs. And you know, I had listened to my talks before and I know that, oh, I can't just choose the highest point I need to make sure I choose some high points and some low points on the uh, fluorescence map. Um, so I won't fall into that trap, of course. <clears throat> um, I'll choose some nice distributions. And lo and behold, every spectra looks almost the same uh, with this weird two-peaked distribution that really didn't make much sense. It looks kind of like pyrite, but kind of not pyrite, too. 
Um, so this was uh, very troubling. And so then I realized I really, I really need to do this experiment correctly and spend the time to do it. Um, so I'm going to map at two energies and compare these two energies here. So I'm going to map at 2470 and 2472. And right away, I begin to see the contrast. If I, look, if I just, com just compare these energies, not doing anything else, I can see that I actually have entire scales made out of, out of the lower energy, which is pregite, and entire scales that are made out of the higher energy uh, position, which is the pyrite. So not only does it precipitate both of these sulfides, but it does so one or the other, typically. Uh, additionally, uh, it also showed that if I go down and get spectra at some of these uh, unique points, I can get very clean spectra of one or the other, or a combination of the two sometimes. And it just showed that I had completely dumb luck to, in my first, say, five or six points that I measured um, without having this guidance of where I should measure spatially, I managed to pick spots that were right on the middle of a, a perfect overlap um, combination each single time. Um, so even if you're trying to be thorough, you can really make silly mistakes. Um, and it really does help to use the spatial information to your advantage and the chemical information to your advantage when you can. I'm going to finish off this uh, presentation here by talking a little bit about beam damage as well. Um, so as we are building fancier and fancier synchrotrons and beam lines, we tend to be trying to make smaller and smaller spots. Uh, as we get brighter and brighter in these new synchrotrons, we are putting uh, an incredible amount of flux density into these small spots. Uh, you can just compare the flux density in terms of photons per square millimeter per second between a bulk experiment and, say, a nanoprobe or a submicron probe, and there's a lot of difference there. Um, these are all real beam lines. I've hidden the names to protect the innocent. Um, but the real question is, you know, are these smaller spot sizes good for all experiments? Uh, can I actually just create damage and be looking at the wrong bit of the experiment? And it really depends on the properties of your materials that you're looking at, of course. Um, at high energies, like 15 kV on calcite, most of the beam goes right through. If I go to lower energies, a lot more of the beam is uh, stopped within the sample. And if I take a sample of, like, say, lapis, um, which has a lot of sulfur in it, uh, at a low energy trying to probe the sulfur speciation, all that flux density is deposited right at the surface. And here we can actually have local spots that can have eight megagray of radiation. Now, if you're not familiar with the unit of gray, it's a joule per kilogram. It's the SI unit for uh, dose. And to give you, in contrast, when you get a medical x-ray to, say, uh, look at your broken arm or something, or a dental x-ray, you're looking at about one milligray of radiation. Uh, for a human being, a dose of one or two grays is considered lethal. And we are now a thousand to a million times higher than that in terms of the radiation dose. So there's quite a bit of dose. If you throw all these photons on the experiment, can you actually, is your detector actually able to count all these photons productively too? Um, so we do a lot to, you know, basically zap the sample with a ton of photons to try to get the best signal, but are we actually using all of these photons efficiently? And the answer is typically not always. Um, and this is, but we can actually use our chemical imaging process to look at this a little bit better. So this is another sample that I looked at. Um, on the left here is the total sulfur distribution. It looks really interesting in there. There's some spots and such. Uh, so I mapped out the sulfur distribution to get this image. And then I picked a few spots to get some spectra. I did the spectra. I thought that was great. And I found a few, some, a few differences. Um, kind of using that same workflow that we showed before. I did the PCA to find those differences, and I mapped um, at several energies that, that the PCA uh, uh, suggested would be interesting. And, oh, I looked here, so, oh, look, I have five, you know, really cool spots that look very different than the rest of the sample. I wonder what, I wonder what those are. And then I realized, oh, wait, um, if I overlay the, that image of my multiple energy map, to where I collected my Zanes points, there's a remarkable correlation of where I measured Zanes to where I see new and different chemistries. So, ah, that's not necessarily part of the sample anymore. Um, so you can actually imagine this as a uh, process that you could use to specifically monitor for beam damage. So you might image your specimen at multiple energies. Um, you might do PCA to identify the unique 
uh, regions of that chemistry and get some uh, guidance on where you want to make sure you measure your sample. You might do that spectroscopy to get a whole slew of squiggly lines that tell you all about the sulfur in your sample. You'd be very excited about that. But now you want to go back and check to make sure that those um, chemistries are real. So we can do a second image uh, of the sample in the same sense and get a new PCA map. And this will now tell us the areas that have been modified. And by comparing the pre-map to the post-map, we can see areas in red here in this bicolor map that are damaged versus green, which were the original one. Um, the real benefit here is that when we're doing the speciation mapping, we're only spending, say, maybe 100 milliseconds at any one pixel. So we're going through this very rapidly. We can assume the damage is much smaller than if we take a full Zane spectra, which might take eight minutes. So there's a much longer length of time that you can actually create damage when you're doing spectroscopy versus doing the mapping. So we're crushing our fingers that the mapping is doing the minimum amount of damage in this case. Uh, so I want to just finish off here then by uh, having a little summary. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'll be able to show you that uh, synchrotron based chemical imaging provides a flexible platform for combining both these imaging XRF mo uh, modalities along with spectroscopy. Uh, the high brilliance, of course, uh, and the high photon flux uh, allows us to do these high sensitivity types of analyses. Although there is a distinct uh, possibility of creating photo damage, and it's something that you need to be aware of and potentially monitor if you are so worried about it. Um, and our real benefit, again, here is that ability to perform spectroscopy as well as the imaging and really combine these together to get that um, visual chemical information. Um, and I hope I've showed you a little bit about the workflow that we get to use at the Beamline. Uh, to really rapidly do this process online while the data is coming out, to really use this to uh, help ourselves collect data rather than just make pretty images and really even be able to monitor this for radiation uh, side effect damages. Uh, I'm going to finish up by uh, showing some acknowledgments. Uh, the people that uh, fund our programs here. Um, I really need to acknowledge the SSRL imaging group that I have here at SSRL, uh, led by myself, uh, Sharon Bone, Nick Edwards, Josh Richardson are all marvelous scientists and they're all here to provide uh, great support when you are doing your experiments. So I uh, would not be able to uh, lead this facility uh, without their expertise. Um, and I want to thank uh, uh, John Barger for the uh, uranium iron example, and my colleagues at Caltex for some of the other samples that I showed. And um, if you are interested in some of more information about our beamlines or the techniques, I highly recommend the www.sansxrays.com. Uh, a lot of great information on data analysis programs and the beamlines can be found there as well. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.